Welcome everyone as you're coming into the room. We'll be starting in about 30 seconds or so. I'm just going to give it a few seconds more and then if people come in late that's okay whoa there's a lot of people on we had 368 rsvp is that right that is right wow you think that you think the electoral college was a hot topic or something yeah, exactly <laughs> okay. more people still coming in we sell popcorn. <laughs> Make a, whoops. I got to do something with my pandemic haircut works better some, some weeks than others. Yeah, uh, okay. These are the moments you have to. You have an advantage, Ned, on that one. Yes. Uh, it's, no hair is an asset in, the, in this world nowadays. Um, okay, why don't we just start to get started and more people are coming in and will join us. Um, so welcome everyone to our discussion of Alex Kazar's amazing new book, Why Do We Still Have the Electoral College? Um, I'm Tova Wang. I'm a democracy fellow at the Ash Center at the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, before we begin, um, the Ash Center would like to acknowledge the land that Harvard sits on um, as a traditional territory of the Massachusetts people and a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among nations. Um, uh, heads up that we're going to dedicate um, at least in the last 15, 20 minutes to questions and answers. I saw some people already submitted some really good questions that I have jotted down, but you can feel free to um, ask questions in the Q&A if you want to chat, chat, and then keep the Q&A for the question. Um, and I, I would be surprised if there are not um, a lot of questions in the Q&A box because this is a, a really um, difficult subject. So, um, and we also want to let the, take this opportunity to let uh, Harvard community members know about the Harvard Votes Challenge. It's a nonpartisan initiative striving to build a civic culture here at Harvard by increasing voter registration and participation across the entire community. We invite all participants to join the movement at voteschallenge.harvard.edu. And finally, this event is uh, being recorded and can be found afterwards at the Ash Center website and on the YouTube channel after we're all done. So welcome again. Um, we're here today to talk about the Electoral College, which absolutely nobody understands except for maybe the two people who are on our panel today. So thankfully for that. Um, and again, it really could be, not be more timely. I have to um, mention something that Rick has tweeted out last night, which is he was going to um, examine whether under the arcane and complicated rules of the Electoral College, the fly from last night might end up winning. So it is very um, timely. <laughs> um, so we're gonna look at it through um, Alex Kaysor's extraordinary new book, um, Why Do We Still Have the Electoral College? And that's an excellent question. Um, and Professor Kaysar comes at this question through his lens as a historian, investigating how this arcane, archaic system came to, to be in existence and has persisted over 200 years, even though most of us know it's insane and kind of anti-democratic. Um, I will hold it up. As you can see, <laughs> I loved reading this book. <laughs> um, because it's there is a linear, linear, linear history to the evolution of the Electoral College and all the efforts to reform it. But there are also these great stories of the different personalities and people and the debates and battles that went on throughout that time that are just really interesting and sometimes surprising. Um, and so, um, it now looks, you know, in a lot of ways, like we may not get ourselves out of this madness, but this is a question that in addition to Professor Kaysar, Professor Ned Foley has also thought about and written about a great deal. And I think that going forward after this election, um, we're gonna be thinking about a lot of really major structural transformational changes to our election system. And I have to assume that the electoral college will be high up on the list of items. So let me introduce Alex Kaysar. Um, 
a longtime friend of mine. He is the Sterling Professor of History and Social Policy at Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government and the author of numerous books, including Why Do We Still Have the Electoral College? And The Right to Vote, The Contested History of Democracy in the United States, a 2001 Pulitzer Prize finalist and winner of the Beverage Award from the American Historical Association for the best book in US history. Is that the best book in US history or the best book in US history? <laughs> I think it was for the year, but you know, I'd be happy to have the uh, have it framed differently. I just noticed that in the wording. Um, and Edward B. Foley, another longtime friend of mine, holds the Eversold Chair in Constitutional Law at the Ohio State University, the Ohio State University, where he also directs its election law program. He also has a new book called Presidential Elections and Majority Rule, which excavates the long forgotten philosophical premises of how the Electoral College is supposed to work as revised by the 12th Amendment to the Constitution, and then uses this historical analysis to provide a feasible basis for reform of state laws that would enable the elect Electoral College to operate according to majority rule objectives it was designed to achieve. And he also um, has written Ballot Battles, The History of Disputed Elections in the United States, which was a finalist for the David J. Langham Senior Prize in American Legal History, and listed as one of 100 most read books about law and social justice. And most exciting is the new news that Ned is going to be a regular columnist for the Washington Post on elections issues, which is fantastic for all of us. So why don't we start with um, Alex giving us the broad contours of the book and now end of the book and we'll, we'll go from there. Thanks, Tova. Um, my thanks to the Ash Center for uh, uh, arranging uh, this event and, and to Tova um, and to Ned who I mean, this may seem a little bit too in-house, but in fact, we we work in, we 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 we've been friends and done overlapping work for, uh, for a long time. We are coming at this from different perspectives, but Tova and Ned are two people whose counsel I often seek, um, and whose work I have admired for a very long time. Um, I want I, I want to be brief and give other people a chance. So let me um, let me let me just comment in a few areas. First, the, the book is not a electoral college is bad book. Um, the, you know, the, the literature is, someone asked me, a historian asked me at a session, what's the historiography? There is no historiography. There's, very, there's almost nothing written about, the, about this history. There's a vast literature of books and articles which fall into the electoral college is bad column or the electoral college is good column. Um, and it's a polemical literature, which has certainly not advanced very far in the last in the last century. Um, uh, and but that's not what I set out to do. I, I, I saw this book as a puzzle. Uh, I was trying to answer a puzzle or address a puzzle, which is the, the question that's the title of the book. Why do we still have it? Um, and that the premise of that, obviously, is that I think that this is a flawed institution. I mean, if, if I thought it was a perfect institution, I wouldn't, you know, th then the answer to the question would be, oh, we, we still have the Electoral College because it's wonderful. Um, but no, but almost nobody thinks that, although I, I can tell you that I have learned um, over since the book's publication date that there are a lot of people on the political right who still maintain that it is wonderful. Um, and, uh, so, but, you know, I see this as, a, you know, as, I saw it as, as a puzzle. We have a flawed institution. There's an enormous number of constitutional amendments that have been introduced into Congress to get rid of it, close to a thousand by now, more than on any other subject. And as long as we have public opinion polls, we know that a majority of the American people want to get rid of the Electoral College. And the institution does not conform with publicly uh, expressed and affirmed values in the United States, such as one person, one vote, uh, or uh, all votes count equally, or the commonsensical proposition that the person who, in an election, the person who wins the most votes uh, wins the election. I mean, that's, that's, the way, that's the way governors are elected. It's the way student council presidents are elected. Um, and uh, so the question we get, well, why, do, why do we still have this? And that took me into this fairly extensive narrative and these stories that Tova alluded to and which I hope maybe we'll get a chance to, uh, to, 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 to narrate uh, um, one or two of just to uh, whet people's appetite um, and to make this seem less abstract. 
But the the answer that I came up with, uh, or the answer is, there's no single bullet answer to why we still have the electoral college. There's an accumulation of factors, some of which are more important at some times than others. One, obviously, it's tough to it's tough to uh, to amend the constitution. You need a two thirds vote in both branches of Congress and three quarters of the states. That's a given. It's tough, but it's not impossible. Um, a second factor is that the institution is, in fact, ridiculously complicated and has a lot of different moving parts. And we may learn more about those moving parts in November, unfortunately, because uh, some of the sm- some of the less visible moving parts could contribute to an electoral crisis. Um, but I mean, for example, when we talk about the Electoral College. We're not just talking about uh, casting electoral votes. Uh, we're also talking about the, quotes contingent election system, which is what happens if nobody wins a majority of the electoral votes. According to the Constitution, what happens then is that the election goes to the, immediately to the House of Representatives, where each in which each state, no matter what its size, gets, the, gets one vote. So if that were to happen, you, you could conceivably have a president chosen by states representing about 20, 22 percent of the population. Um, and we, we don't think about that very often because the contingent election system hasn't been used um, in, since uh, 1824, but it could be, and we've come close to having to use it again um, within the last 60 to 80 years. Um, a third factor, and this is something where, you know, for activists, uh, people, you know, we, we have to remind ourselves to stick with it, is that the, there's a rhythm to a lot of electoral college reform efforts, which is that they get set in motion by a crisis or an anticipated crisis or the aftermath of, a, of an almost crisis. Um, and then people lose sight of it. The electoral college, after all, is an institution that is used only once every four years and it doesn't always malfunction. Um, so there's, a, there's, there's a, in some sense, a conservative rhythm uh, built into it that deflects reform. But let me turn now to the, t- the two final factors. Uh, uh, one is partisan interest, not in all periods, but in some periods, political parties, p- individual political parties have blocked reform because they thought that the Electoral College served their interest. Again, this has not always been true. There have been people who have voted their conscience and their views, not their partisan interest. And sometimes it's not clear what a partisan interest uh, is. But we live in one of the most prolonged periods of partisan blockage of reforms um, that we have had in US history. Since 1980, the Republican Party has been pretty much convinced that the Electoral College serves them. They may be right. Um, And they have sort of blocked, uh, they have just blocked and stymied uh, reforms. Um, and, and in some sense, until recently, I think also paralyzed Democrats who did want reform. Uh, there have been no congressional hearings on electoral college reform or formal hearings. There have been informal, informal gatherings, but no formal hearings in the 21st century, uh, which is a remarkable fact. Um, so we have partisan interest. And then the last factor um, and part of the story I tell uh, at some length is that the preservation of the Electoral College um, has come about in good part uh, or, or in some respects, the preservation of the Electoral College is, is directly linked to the maintenance of white supremacy in the South. Um, and I sketch out the story both before the Civil War, when there was slavery, and 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 more, somewhat more surprisingly, in the years after Reconstruction, but from say the 1880s into the 1960s, and arguably into the 1970s as well, and during that period, efforts to replace the Electoral College uh, with a national popular vote. Now, other reforms were on the table and had different political implications, but uh, efforts to to uh, adopt a national popular vote were stymied uh, by the segregationist South, the white supremacist South, because they, in fact, wielded a considerable uh, extra influence, a considerable extra weight of power during that period because, uh, because of the Electoral College. The Electoral College gives a state 
power in proportion to its population, not in, not in proportion to the number of votes that are cast. And what you had in effect is that white Southerners uh, were, we know about the three fifths clause before uh, the Civil War when there was slavery, but white Southerners benefited from what might be called the five fifths clause from the 1880s uh, into, into the, the 1970s. And the culmination that they kept, they kept a national popular vote off the table uh, and off the table of discussion. And then, and then the culmination of these efforts occurred in 1969, 70, uh, a, a too little known episode when a constitutional amendment to abolish the electoral college and adopt a national popular vote passed the House of Representatives by an 82% vote. That's one of six occasions on which um, such an amendment uh, or, or a reform amendment passed one branch of Congress. But it got an 82% vote in the House of Representatives, which is an astonishingly large figure. And it obviously meant that there was significant bipartisan support. And then it went to the Senate, where it was stalled largely by the uh, segregationist leadership of the Senate Judiciary Committee with, with some others. And, and it prevented the issue from coming up for a vote for a year. And when it did come up for a vote, um, the, uh, the resolution was defeated by a filibuster. It never was even allowed to come to a floor vote. It was defeated by a filibuster uh, led by Southern senators. Um, and they, they were unable, they came a few votes short of ending the filibuster. So we have white supremacy sitting there as a very major factor. Um, I think, I, you know, that, that's a sketch of what the arguments are. And again, I'll let Tova prod me about which stories we, people might be interested in hearing uh, um, and, and, and how to tell them. I think obviously uh, people in this audience are also going to be, the question is going to be, or two questions might be lurking. One, how's it going to affect this election? And the starting point here is simply, we know there would be no drama about this election right now. Uh, you wouldn't have bothered to watch the debate last night, probably, um, if we had a national popular vote. There is no one in the United States, except possibly Donald Trump himself, and even that, who thinks that Donald Trump is going to win the popular vote. Uh, that is not going to happen. His, own, the, the, his only chance of winning is because of the Electoral College. Uh, that's an important fact. Second thing is, are there, you know, what are the odds of uh, getting rid of the Electoral College? You know, I, I've, you know, I've just published a book chronicling 220 years of failure, so I, I, it would be ill-advised for me to pirouette and say, oh, we can do it, you know, call me next week, we'll take care of it. Um, but I actually think that we are, we are at a more promising moment of electoral college reform than we have been at any point in the last, certainly in the last 40 years. And I think we may be approaching the possibilities that existed in the 1960s and 1970s, although much will depend on what happens in this election. So with that, let me turn this back over to Tova and Ned and uh, uh, I'm all ears. Thank you, Alex. Um, yeah, I am going to turn it over to Ned, who I know has a little bit of a different perspective, both on the history and on some of the um, reform ideas that are out there. So I'm going to give him the floor now. Great. Um, thanks so much. And it is wonderful to be with both of you because we do have friendships that go way back and it's nice to get together, even if it's through um, this Zoom platform. Um, but uh, um, and I, and I owe, you know, I've, I've, I've said this before, but I can't say it enough how much I owe a huge intellectual debt to Alex, but for both books that I've written, in essence, the Ballot Battles book and now this new book on uh, the Electoral College really um, are derivative in a way of, of Alex's work, or they, they try to um, use Alex's work as a premise and then address more specific, narrower topics. So I just want to acknowledge that. Um, so like Alex said, you know, he started a, his book with a, a puzzle. I sort of did the same with mine. And my puzzle was after looking at the 2016 results, uh, when everybody was focused on the discrepancy between um, the so-called national popular vote that Hillary Clinton won, but losing in the Electoral College, um, 
and that was obviously similar to 2000, I was actually focusing on different numbers. And I noticed that in the six battleground states, uh, of Florida, North Carolina, Arizona, and then ones we all focus on, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, uh, President Trump won his electoral college victory by winning all six of those states with less than 50% of the popular vote. Uh, so uh, he gets all of the electoral votes from all those states, um, and yet he's on, you know, there are more ballots cast against him, if you will, than for him. So that seemed weird in and of itself, but it also seemed um, anomalous to what I understood superficially about the Electoral College, because just looking at the 12th Amendment, it requires um, a candidate to win a majority of electoral votes, or else you go to this contingent election uh, provision that Alex mentioned that was last used in 1824. So I knew that the authors of the 12th Amendment had a, a concept of majority uh, winner in mind, and, and uh, had a runoff procedure for what would only be a plurality um, win, if you will, in the in the electoral college. That's it was a plurality that caused the 1824 election to go to uh, the House. But and so here was President Trump winning, to be sure, an electoral college majority, but only because of his plurality victories at the state level. You know, um, President Trump gets a little more than 300 electoral votes, but a hundred of them, one third of them, come from these uh, minority wins, these plurality wins. He could not get to the magic number of 270 without these sub 50% victories in the battleground states. So, you know, as a, a law scholar, you know, in a culture of law where we think about original intent, I think, you know, would this conform to the original intent of the authors of the 12th Amendment? So I went into the into the histories, in, into Alex's territory, not knowing really what I would find and, and, and asking Alex's advice going along the way. And I was just struck, um, and this surprised me, just how different philosophically the premises of the 12th Amendment were from the original Electoral College. This was a blind spot in my understanding, and I think at least among the legal community, we sort of thought that the 12th Amendment was a little bit of a technical fix to the problem that emerged in 1800 with the tie vote between Jefferson and Burr, but that re it really wasn't anything important. Uh, my law professor, constitutional law professor, said, you know, the really important amendments are the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments that, that during Reconstruction, the 12th Amendment, don't worry about. But in fact, um, reading the debates in Congress, there's, you know, they, they spent a lot of time and they were rethinking the two pillars of uh, the United States of America, having been through it for four presidential elections. And the two pillars were federalism on the one hand, it was a United States, it was a, a, a federated republic, but it was also a Republican form of government. So they wanted to, to value republicanism as a philo philosophical principle. And, and federalism. And they wanted to renegotiate that because it didn't work. Um, they had hoped to avoid political parties. That didn't happen. And they knew they lived in a world of two-party contestation, the Federalist Party of Adams and Hamilton, and then the Jeffersonian Party of Jefferson and, and Madison. And so they, they rewrote the Electoral College with party competition in mind. And the idea was to have the majority party prevail but the majority party understood in this federalism way. So you were gonna achieve a, a, your electoral college majority by aggregating majorities at the state level. In fact, Jefferson and Madison manipulated the rules of, of, the, of how the electors of Virginia were appointed for the election of 1800 to make sure that Jefferson got winner take all because he was the majority preferred candidate of his home state. He didn't wanna split any electoral votes with the other party. And so they had this sense that states would use their power to appoint electors to reflect majority preferences. Now, again, their concept of majority rule was in, you know, in a world where women couldn't vote, there was slavery. I don't wanna say that it was our concept of one person, one vote, uh, but they had a conception of an electorate that was eligible to vote and they wanted majority wins, not plurality wins. And they're quite explicit about that in the 12th Amendment debates. So again, we could get into some of the more, the more details. So then the rest of my book, having sort of set that stage, 
talks about how we um, kind of abandon that philosophy at the state level through the use of winner take all to appoint electors, but not based on majority votes, but plurality votes at the state level. This is really an innovation of the Jacksonian era after the election of 1824. There had been states like Massachusetts and New Hampshire that had had runoffs of different kinds if the vote for an elector was under 50%, that wasn't gonna be good enough and you had some form of runoff to guarantee majority rule. Um, but that disappeared. We could talk about the, the ways in which that system is malfunctioned. Um, but the, the, the main takeaway is if you look at the totality of elections that have occurred since the 12th Amendment was adopted, 1992, 2000 and 2016 are all elections which seem inconsistent with this Jeffersonian premise um, that you're supposed to get a majority in the electoral vote through uh, your underlying state-based majorities. Um, Bill Clinton, the only state that he's a majority winner at, at the state level is his own state of Arkansas, as well as the District of Columbia. And I have even a little quip in the book, you know, his name is William Jefferson Clinton but he's the least Jeffersonian of presidential winners <laughs> because it, his victory does not conform to the Jeffersonian uh, vision. Uh, so this is a nonpartisan point. Um, now, you know, we, again, people debate whether Ross Perot was a spoiler. Um, the point is that the system as designed by the 12th Amendment can't really handle third parties and independent candidates because it was designed for two party competition. Um, and uh, you know, people do think that Ralph Nader was definitely a spoiler factor in Florida in 2000. A lot harder to know for sure whether Gary Johnson and Joel Stein were spoilers in 2016. We certainly know that Trump was under 50%. What we don't know is whether some form of runoff or ranked choice voting system would have avoided you know, a spoiler effect and led to a different result. So just to wrap up quickly and then throw it back for for conversation, you know, looking forward, which is the part of the point of the book, in a world where we're not going to get a constitutional amendment, because I'm pessimistic about, about that, you know, what's the next best alternative? And so what I propose is the use of ranked choice voting like Maine has done. Uh, any state currently has the power to do it. And it, you don't need an interstate compact for this. Each state can do it on its own. And if pivotal battleground states adopt something like ranked choice voting to guarantee majority winners, then at least the operation of the system would conform to its own expectations as opposed to being aberrational to its own goals, which is what we have now. Great, thank you, Ned. Um, so I know that people are gonna to wanna to talk about what's going on right now and we definitely will, but I do wanna go through some of the interesting pieces of the history of all this and how we got here. My first question from the outset of the book, which is somewhat answered, is what were these guys, the framers, thinking in the first place? How did we get to this having an electoral college at all, as, as opposed to a national popular vote when they were putting this thing to together? Um, look, the, 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 when the framers got to Philadelphia, they they didn't know quite know what to do about this. They, they, they didn't have models. Uh, they, uh, you know, the, their experience with chief executives was a, basically of hereditary or appointed executives. They, they weren't sure about how to do it. Uh, so, you know, the, uh, the, I think that their thinking overall was framed by, by the notion that co there was some notion that, okay, Congress gets to choose the chief executive. And then they also recognized as they pressed for separation of powers, is that 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 was a bad idea, um, and they struggled with it. There's a there's a marvelous point in, in the debates where Madison says, "Well, okay, where can the authority of the chief executive come from? It shouldn't come from Congress." Um, and you know, where it's been mentioned that it should be from Congress, but that's a bad idea. It can't. It's not the courts that should appoint uh, the president. You know, maybe the governors and actually Madison ends up supporting a national popular vote. Um, but but he's the na national popular vote was on the table. It was discussed. It was discussed. It was on the table. Not, you know, it didn't stay on the table for a whole long time, but it was on the table. It was discussed. And there were several sources of opposition. Um, there were people who thought that 
it wasn't feasible because uh, of the logistics of doing a national vote at that time, given the state of transportation and communication. There were people who thought that the people, that, that the voting public, uh, the, the, the white male property owning people, um, that, 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 that they could not be sufficiently informed about the candidates to wisely vote um, in an election. And then the third source of opposition came from the slave states, because in a national popular vote, you don't get any, you don't get any credit, so to speak, uh, for, your, for your slaves. So, um, you know, Madison's fellow Southerners were on the whole uh, against it. But so that idea comes up, what's in there. Um, but I think that, I think that what, they're, they're, they're struggling to separate powers, but to figure out where the source of authority should come from. And, you know, and then the story is kind, of, is kind of well known. They deadlocked. They couldn't decide. They kept going around all summer. They got to the end of August. It's really hot in Philadelphia at the end of August. Um, you know, they were, they were tired. They had been there all summer. So what happened is what, you know, we can all imagine happening in that circumstance. They said, okay, let's go on vacation and leave a committee uh, to iron out the parts that we didn't finish. It was called, the, the committee was literally called the Committee on on postponed parts. Um, and that's the group that came up with uh, with the Electoral College. And one way to think of it, I guess in terms of really trying to understand the grammar of what's in their people's heads, is that the Electoral College is a legislature. In other words, the proportion matches exactly the proportions in Congress. Um, the, the Electoral College is a legislature that doesn't ever legislate. So the problems of separation of power uh, and corruption are obviated. Right. And so in other words, um, they didn't have all the answers and <laughs> they just kind of said, well, let's give it a try. Um, the system and, and that's, you know, and, and now we're here. Right. And they had no idea how it would work. I mean, and as Ned points out so beautifully, discusses so beautifully, you know, I mean, they end up having to amend the Constitution, uh, you know, within uh, f 15 years um, of its adoption because they screwed up uh, because they you know, what they had done didn't match the reality of the politics. They didn't know how it would work. Right. And Madison writes this great, amusing letter in the 1820s, reflecting back on this saying, just what Alex said, it was a long, hot summer. They got tired and they kind of rushed at the end and it was not their finest hour. It's a sort of paraphrasing this letter, but it sort of admits the frailty of the, of the moment. And yet they made it incredibly hard to amend the constitution at the same time. Um, they I'm also curious about if we, we want to get into to that at the same time, because it sounds like they at this, first of all thought, well, we can try it now and fix it later and then made it incredibly hard to fix later. But um, I want to just uh, go back to something that you started to touch on Alex, but I think is such a dominant theme of the book and the history, which is both slavery and um, systemic racism throughout the country's history, which you know seems to be a huge part of everything uh, in our country's history. And um, that it started out with the issue of uh, the three-fifths, counting slaves as three-fifths people, but really went from there throughout to, throughout into the seventies, right? Yeah. And how, how oh. did that play out in different eras? Well, it's, um, you know, I mean, look, uh, I mean, the, the way it, it plays out in, in similar fashion, I mean, and again, to, to explicate what I said before, you know, a little bit, um, when there was, um, you know, under slavery, I mean, once they had set up this, once they had set up this institution and the institution replicated, I mean, another, I think, virtue of it in terms of their trying to make a decision was that it, the, the, the Constitutional Convention had struggled in earlier in the summer on questions of representation in Congress, how much representation would each state get? And there were two, the, there were the two great compromises between large and small states, um, and which is produced a bicameral legislature, um, and between slave and free states, okay? And the compromise that was reached was that Southern states with slavery would get representation in Congress for all the free white people and three fifths of all others. Okay. Um, well, once that's adopted and it becomes a kind of entitlement in a sense, uh, 
you know, you see it in 1816, an otherwise quite obscure uh, Pennsylvania senator named Abner Laycock, um, in the midst of reform debates, because there, this is a these the first 30 years are always trying to reform the electoral college, usually with a district system, but they're having a debate. And then Laycock stands up and says, look, we're talking about bringing the election closer to the people, um, you know, it, et cetera. So and getting rid of winner take all, why not just have the people vote? You know, it's like he sort of stands up and, and, and his speech in Congress has a kind of air of spontaneity to it. Um, and then, uh, you know, the discussion goes on, then he brings it up again. And then when he brings it up again, other people start standing up and saying, hey, you know, this is a this is maybe a good idea. One of them is Rufus King, who was at the Constitutional Convention um, and who was a Federalist candidate for president or vice president in 1816. A leading figure from the 1790s, uh, late 1780s, uh, for a long time, he's a very powerful. And he stands up and says, "Yeah, you know, let's let's maybe this national popular vote thing is a good idea." And so, you know, there's some talking pros and cons. And then, what brings the conversation to a close uh, is when several very prominent uh, Southern senators, including James Barber of Virginia, stand up and say this is unacceptable to the South, uh, having a national popular vote. I mean, he, I've, I don't have the exact quote in front of me, but he says something like, it has pleased God to give the Southern states a population anomalous. Uh, I'm not sure whether God really uh, played a role in, in, in bringing slavery to the Southern states. But then basically what he and others point out is that if you switch to a national popular vote, they would lose all the political influence they wielded on behalf of their enslaved populations. And uh, that, that, uh, that that was completely unacceptable and they would not even support appointing a committee to look into it. Um, you know, and that's what that's just one of those. That's how it played out in that period. And, you know, there are later stories we can talk about also if we have time. Yeah. I mean, in the interest of time, I can't believe how fast it's going by. I do want to start to get towards a more contemporary period, at least. Um, and then, you know, we can talk about what's going on now and get to questions from the participants, some of which I already have written down. Um, so just getting now into the post World War II era, there was a whole bunch of shifting of alignments of the parties. The racial issues were becoming a, a different set of um, challenges for people. And I do want to prod you just because I found it very interesting, um, the, Alex, the story of what went on um, in the 1970s when there was a, actually a split in Black leadership around um, the Electoral College. So there wasn't even any uh, consensus on that. Right. I mean, when again, if they're the story that I alluded to before, when they when they lose in the Senate in 1970, the issue still is lingering around a little bit. And then um, the 1976 election, which was almost a wrong winner election. I mean, uh, Gerald Ford almost won the Electoral College vote, even though Jimmy Carter won the popular vote. But it was all by pretty narrow margins. And actually, that was a year when there were a lot of battleground states um, and a lot of those states came out. Uh, quite close. So that, that renewed interest um, in electoral college reform, Birch Bayh, who had led the effort in the 1960s and had never quite dropped it, starts pushing it again. And if you read the newspapers, you know, the, the punditry from late 1976 and early 1977, uh, just about everybody thinks electoral college reform is now going to happen. We're going to be able to push it over the top. Um, opponents delay and stall. And one of the things that emerges over the next year or two is this split uh, among uh, African-American leaders, uh, a split basically into two camps. Um, one, one group that is firmly uh, in favor of replacing the Electoral College with a national popular vote, um, which is, you know, we tend to think, of course, that was the position, but that was a position of a number of people. John Conyers was very important um, in taking that position. He was one of the founders of the Congressional Black Caucus. Um, other black elected officials, most, most black members of Congress 
uh, took that position. Ed Brooke, the only African American senator, took that position. Uh, although he was a, he was a Republican. Um, and John Lewis, who was not yet elected but was already influential, uh, also took that position in favor of a national popular vote. But on the other side of that split were the leaders of many of the most important uh, black organizations of the era. And they took the stance that the Electoral College actually benefited uh, the African-American community. Um, the, their reasoning was that African-Americans had become swing voters in key swing or battleground states in the North. And thus that they wielded um, a significant amount of political power because they had to be courted um, by the two political parties. And again, we have to remember, you know, this is an era when uh, African-American ties to the Republican Party are not so distant in the past at all. You know, the only the only African-American in the Senate, Ed Brooke, is a Republican. Um, and so um, there is this split and it gets it gets kind of nasty. Um, and but it does it, it um, you know, and in, in well, l let me say two things. I think that the anti-reform leaders uh, of the African-American community provide a rationale and maybe a reason or a cover for a number of senators to say they're opposing electoral college reform uh, actually for the sake of the African-American community. I'm not sure that was their, uh, that was their view because um, some, some liber moderate to liberal senators uh, voted against electoral college reform. One of them I might note was a sen young senator from Delaware, uh, Joe Biden, um, who's the only person around who I think today who actually voted on electoral college reform and he voted against it. Um, since that time, um, notably, uh, I think just about all of the African-American organizations um, from that era have, ch have, have officially and formally changed their position and embraced uh, uh, a national popular vote. And even when so the NAACP went, went so far as to say we were wrong. It was, they were saying, you know, basically, uh, you know, we did the calculations wrong. We weren't swing voters. The Republican Party was ignoring us already by the by the late 1970s. Um, and, you know, we just our analysis was wrong. I mean, it was an analysis that was rooted largely in expecting that the 1976 election would be replicated in all future elections. And that's that's a problem with all sorts of reform. Right. We see the most recent pattern. We say, aha, that's the way things are going. And it isn't always the case. Yeah, I mean, it seems like, um, you know, this is a story of uh, everybody trying to calculate out the political advantage, as we see now, with almost everything having to do with elections and either getting it wrong or right, but, you know, figuring it out and trying to play the games. And 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 I also, I'll just say one thing more about the book, and then we'll get into to the now, because I know that's what people have questions about. But it was also striking to me that part of the debate in the early days was also that the states were very adamant about maintaining control out over how electors were appointed and basically what the rules of elections were state by state. And we find ourselves today really suffering from that um, and that there are these completely disparate rules around voting um, that was something that they were very protective of keeping back in that time because of this debate to some degree. Um, so I just wanted to note that that was part of the conversation. So Ned, I wanna to turn to you as we start to talk about what's happening now. Um, there are a lot of concerns about how the Electoral College might play out this year. Everything from what if um, Trump dies, but he's still on the ballot. And so it gets kicked to the Electoral to what um, Trump has you know, alluded to himself about it being kicked to the Congress, um, which we talked about, which is what the contingent election is. One thing that is I, I've talked to Alex about, which is kind of baffling, and we have actually somewhat different memories of it, but maybe then you'll, you'll break the tie. Um, it's extraordinary to me that after the 2000 election um, that this didn't have more momentum and that it hasn't gotten closer in more recent times. 
I think, you know, 2016, we were, everyone was just like head spinning and there wasn't just a, a lot of thought being given to it, but it, it seems like there have been moments in time when it should have been addressed. Um, so, you know, I wanted to ask you to respond to that. And then for both of you, I think the big overriding question that people are, are having both before and during the, the panel is what, what is the, what are the prospects for reform and what is the best form of, of uh, Form, uh, reforming the electoral college and how will we go about doing that? And I know Ned, for you, I mean, what is your take on national popular vote, compact, and all that's about, as opposed to having other kinds of answers to this issue? Sure. Um, so, so first, you, Toba, alluded at the outset the fact that the electoral college doesn't conform to sort of basic norms of democracy that we think of, like one person, one vote. I think Alex mentioned that as well. So, from a law perspective, you know, we may get to a juncture, I mean, hope not, where there's a conflict between rule of law values, like if this contingent election procedure gets put into place. I mean, the law is clear on how that works. It, you need 26 votes in this in, in the House of Representatives with, with each state having one vote, whether it's Wyoming or California, regardless of population, not very democratic at all, kind of like the U.S. Senate is not very democratic at all on a national population equality basis, but but sometimes the law is clear in unfortunate ways, and, and we may just have to suffer through uh, the enforcement. You, you have to run elections according to the rules when you vote, and we have the rules that we currently have. Um, so I guess on that, I do think since you know 2000 what is what triggered the idea of the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, as I understand it, as an effort to end run the difficulty of a constitutional amendment and say, hey, can we use the electoral college kind of against itself? It's the many folks um, you know, in the audience will know that what that compact would do is that if enough states sign on that they all have 270 electoral votes, they'll pool their votes in the compact, giving the electoral college winner to the national popular vote as opposed to whoever wins in their own state. So it's a kind of a creative idea. A couple of things I discuss in my book. One is it's unclear that the Supreme Court will accept it because it is fundamentally at odds with the state-based structure of the electoral college system. So I think that could go either way in the Supreme Court. Um, the other thing uh, about it is, it, you know, even after 2016, although there was momentum of more states signing on, after 2016 is it has not gotten close enough where people are thinking you know, one more state and we've reached the magic number of 270 for the compact taking effect. So just as a practical matter of what's the most feasible reform, one of the things I wanted to point out, if only Florida had adopted a runoff system or ranked choice voting, that would have tipped the balance in 2000. You would have avoided all the problems of the hanging chads because Ralph Nader couldn't have uh, in effect suppressed the latent support for Al Gore that was split off because people were entitled to prefer Ralph Nader, but given the choice of a backup, they, I think most political scientists do think some form of runoff would have favored uh, Gore over Bush. And, and just one state adopting a majority re requirement would have, would have tipped the entire electoral college to conform to the national popular vote. So even, even if your own goal is to get alignment between the electoral college result and the national popular vote, the best pragmatic means to that in the short run might be targeting the battleground states. Again, you know, if, if Hillary Clinton would have won runoffs in Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, which is possible, then she would have won the electoral college and there would have been alignment between the electoral college result and the overall national popular vote. So, you know, part of the goal of my book is just to think about feasibility in the short run, even if you like the idea of a, of a national popular vote, either amendment or some reform in the long run. And so Alex, we know that you have publicly supported the, the compact, but are also of a little bit of two, two minds uh, about it. And so what's the, what, what, what do you like about it and what do you not like about it? In the immortal words of John Kerry, I was for it before I was against it or something. <laughs> they uh -oh. want to claim it out, but. Um, I have been a supporter of the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact as a mobilizing device, as a, pol as a political movement 
to try to mobilize support uh, for electoral college reform. And I think it has been, um, it has been very successful uh, at, at doing that. Or, or, well, it has been very successful. I worry to a considerable degree that in fact, lots of people don't know that their states have already joined the compact. I mean, you know, when I, I do talks to public groups at libraries and things here in Massachusetts, I find that about 20% of the population knows that Massachusetts has joined the compact. And I worry about that. But on the whole, I have favored the, com the compact as an organizing device. I don't favor it as a solution. Uh, I, you know, I think that uh, if the compact were put into place, for one thing, it would suffer from the non-majoritarian uh, issues that Ned has, has, has talked about, because the compact says the presidency will go to the person who wins, who wins the most electoral votes, not necessarily a majority. And there's some all sorts of discussions going on about how to improve that, but they haven't been very fruitful yet. Um, I also worry about it as because of, I think that the compact is inherently unstable. Um, even if we get to the 270 uh, number in a given election, and even if we get through the Supreme Court or the, you know, all the lawsuits that will take place um, during this, suppose we implement um, the compact for an election and the election is run according to compact rules and Massachusetts ends up, according to compact rules, casting its electoral votes uh, for a conservative Republican who th that was not supported by the state of Massachusetts. Um, I would have to believe that whatever the outcome of these things, that some states will leave the compact after the first time through. And once they leave the compact, then the compact is no longer in effect. So you have a situation where the compact, you could have you could have one presidential election run according to the compact, and then the next one will revert to the old electoral college rules. That's the kind of instability and mess that I think uh, we we don't want to have. Um, so I think that you know, build. There have been a lot of ideas, you know, around, and uh, there are a lot of people with their individual reforms that they want to promote, and I'm not against any of them. But my hope is that. Um, if we get close enough on various fronts that there would be a strategy for having a reform movement segue into a uh, movement for a national popular vote. And let me, I, I wanna add a couple of different things on this list. Um, I'd be accused of, be, I mean, I'm not overly optimistic. A lot of this is gonna depend on what happens in this election and other elections, but you know, I just, just you know, there's evidence that it's not I'm not saying this just because of what I've been smoking recently, um, but um, you, you know, the uh, in 1956 in the Senate, um, there was a vote. There's a vote on various reforms, but there was a vote on on a national popular vote amendment. Uh, it got 11 po positive votes. Okay, that was 1956. 15, 14 years later, in 1970, it got 57. Okay, from 11 to 57 in 14 years is a pretty dramatic switch. Um, and I think that a lot is going to depend on what happens with, basically what happens in the election, and thus I'm going to make the presumption that, uh, that Joe Biden will win. But the secondary question is what happens to the Republican Party in the wake of, if, if the Republican Party loses badly, what happens to it? Um, if, if the Republican Party loses Georgia or Texas, um, do they still regard winner take all and the Electoral College as being so favorable uh, as, as, as they do now? I mean, that's even aside from the question about whether the Republican Party will hold, will hold together. So, uh, you know, in the in, in the past, I mean, again, well, part of the point of my book was to, to, to try to seek some insights for uh, people trying to understand actions today. In the past, reform efforts have done best when the party systems, when the party system was itself in flux and party alignments were in transition. Um, you know, the period of... Uh, 1815 to 1825, there is no two-party system uh, in effect. And I would, I would argue that in 1968, 
nine seventy, there was also there was no two party system either. There were not there were not two parties. There were at least three and possibly four, because the southern and northern wings of the Democratic Party had re were had really severed all relations, and the southern wing was beginning its migration into the Republican Party. Um, so, so, Alex, you haven't you're saying don't give up hope on having. A constitutional amendment in our home. I have not. I mean, you know, again, would I bet the ranch on it? No, but I'm not giving up hope on it. And Ned, I know that you've also explored, you've talked about ranked choice voting. And I know we're running out of time, so I want to remind people that if they do still have questions, to throw them in the Q&A and we'll try and get to them. But there have been other, um, and Alex, you, you talk about this in the book too, there have been other types of proposals for trying to fix this to become more democratic like using proportional representation, which I guess the two states do, or having districts. Um, is any of that viable? Is that Are those paths that are worth going down? I'm gonna start with Ned. Well, I, and here I draw on Alex's book. You see, the, the, there's the hydraulic pressure of the states, particularly large states, to want to, to use winner take all because of the clout that that gives a state. Um, and so even if some form of proportional representation might be attractive normatively, unless it's posed on a nationwide basis, most states aren't going to sort of unilaterally do it. I mean, so Florida doesn't want to divide its vote in half, and California doesn't want to do, do that. So, so I think that has to be a nationwide reform. But what I do think is, despite the truth of that hydraulic pressure, if you will, it, the, it doesn't really matter from the state's perspective whether they throw all their clout to a plurality winner or a majority winner, they still have that clout. So I don't think from a state's perspective, it's a downside to you to move to a ranked choice voting or some runoff mechanism. Um, so that's why I think that reform is more feasible in the short run. Yeah, right. I, and and to, to add my two cents here, I think that a nationally mandated proportional system in which you get the you get electoral votes in proportion to your popular vote in, in, in a given state. Um, you know, I regard that as not quite as good as a national popular vote, but it would satisfy a lot of people who are concerned about federalism and states' rights and states maintaining some control. And it would solve many of the problems that we have with the Electoral College. I'm just going to throw out one more idea that did also come up in the chat, and then I'll ask for any last thoughts. But it has also been thrown out there that if we um, gave statehood to DC and Puerto Rico if they want it, and you know some of the islands, that that would be another way of kind of getting at the this you know the the lack of uh, proportionality in the system. Is that is that another route to try and explore? I mean, I'm all for doing that. I I don't see that that is more likely to have success than these other paths that we're, that, that we're talking about. I mean, you know, we we know what the fate of DC statehood has been in the past, you know, alas. Um, and I think that- and I, would, we, I would support those reforms on their own merits. I wouldn't say that they're a solution to how to do presidential elections. Um, all right, well, I'm, we're starting to run out of time. Um, I guess I will give you the opportunity to give any uh, kind of last thoughts, but also any predictions that you might have, whether even if um, there isn't a split in the, the national popular vote this year in the Electoral College, if the insanity <laughs> around the last several months and, and earlier than that will give rise to enough of an impetus to just really rethink all sorts of institutions in our democracy um, with the Electoral College being part of that and it being uh, a more, this being the crisis in a way that um, that uh, triggers serious discussion about it. Well, should yeah, I go, you go uh, first. Yeah, so I wanna give Alex the last word. Um, so I do think if, 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 if Vice President Biden wins and the Democrats take the Senate, I think we're likely to get a lot of voting reform, uh, but I don't know that it's necessarily Electoral College reform. There may be an attempt to that, but I think we'll get an improvement on the Voting Rights Act, address the preclearance. I mean, some of this is technical, but I think there'll be an effort to try to fix the preclearance formula. I mean, I think there's a long list of voting rights agenda that's pent up that will be implemented. But in terms of presidential elections, I still think the debate will be whether to try to go big and get a constitutional amendment or, or, or not. I, I do think if, if there is a discrepancy 
and President Trump wins the Electoral College, not the popular vote again, then I think there will be renewed push for the compact, whether it's successful or not, who knows, but it, it will lead to the problems that Alex identified about potentially being adopted temporarily, but being unstable. So Electoral College reform is gonna be a long-term effort, I think, not a short-term fix. I wish I could disagree with that, but I, um, but I, I, not that I like disagreeing with Ned, but I, um, I think I think a lot is going to depend on what's uh, on what happens in this election. I mean, you know, from someone who's looked a lot at electoral college reform, I, I can imagine if Biden wins and uh, and wins big, wins big enough to avoid a crisis, and if uh, Democrats win the Senate. You know, and again, it will feel like a script that I have read before and written about. Um, I can see backing off electoral college reform, uh, making it less of a priority, and it's a, and it's a heavy lift to make it happen. Um, and so the issue will just toddle on on the back burner for uh, for a while. But I think there is a non-trivial chance that we are going to end up in a electoral crisis of one sort or another in November or November into December, and an electoral crisis that will implicate um, not only the gap between the electoral vote and uh, and the popular vote, but which will implicate also some of the lesser known details of the mechanism of the electoral college, e.g., and importantly, e.g., that states have the right to determine how electors will be, the state legislatures have the right to determine how electors uh, will be chosen. I mean, Ned and I have both been part, uh, been involved in some discussions about what might happen if there is a disputed, uh, if there are disputes about the popular vote totals, or if there were, or lots of disputes and challenges. Uh, to the vote totals in particular battleground states um, and whether a state legislature might at that point um, say, you know, we can't get this straightened out. We can't get it straightened out in time. Um, and so we're just going to appoint our own slates of electors. And there will be legal battles about that, but they, they may try to do it. The Republican, and by the way, the legislatures in six battleground states are entirely Republican. Um, and the Republican legislature of Florida was poised to make a similar move in 2000. So and you, you both think that that would survive a legal challenge? Not necessarily, but it would do, I think it would depend. We don't, we don't know exactly what the legal challenge would look like. And, it, and the outcome, as far as I can tell, speaking as a, as a non-lawyer who, who just shooting my mouth off here, it would depend a lot what the lawsuit was uh, and, and what, what the claims were. So, but I, I guess the point is that if we end up in a electoral and political crisis that is precipitated by the mechanisms of the electoral college, whether it's that one or then also, as Ned has written about a lot about who gets to count the electoral votes once it gets to Washington. I mean, it's a, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of room for mishap because of the details of this institution. And I would say the odds are quite good that we're going to end up in some kind of crisis of that sort. And that may really change the momentum. We may have to end on that cheery note. Um, <laughs> <laughs> as we so often do on these Zoom calls about democracy these days. But I want to thank both Professor Kazar and Professor Foley. And also to thank everybody at ASH um, for helping put this together. Melissa Daniello, um, Sarah B Rebecca Krusa, and um, James Rosaya. And thank you all for joining us. I'm sure we'll continue to talk about this for better or worse and um, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.